1919 was an auspicious year in history. The First World War ended, ushering a drastic change in the world order. The Philippine Islands had been a U.S. territory for two decades and was promised independence under the Jones Law of 1916. Progressive reformers saw the country and its people as a major target for modernization, and education was its main weapon. Seven forward-looking Filipinas came together in 1919 to create a school where young women could gain the knowledge and skills that would make them modern women. Paz Marquez Benitez was the first president of the Philippine Women's College. Jose Abad Santos was its first chairman of the Board of Trustees. Francisca Tirona Benitez was the second president and with her husband, Dean Conrado, guided the school from a house on A. Flores Street to its iconic Taft Avenue campus. In 1932, the college became a university, making PWU the first university for women in Asia founded by Asians. It provided a space where innovations in education flourished and young people were encouraged to be the best that they could be. For over 100 years, the Philippine Women's University has been known as a leader in quality education. In 1934, PWU moved into its main campus on Taft Avenue, and since the 1970s has been co-educational. Located in the heart of Metro Manila, it is easily accessible by public transport and surrounded by affordable housing. Today's PWU offers undergraduate and graduate courses in several fields of study. Its business and management programs are responsive to the needs of industry using evolving technology for global competence. PWU graduates excel in arts and sciences, education, social work, and diplomacy. Its fine arts and music programs have produced outstanding graduates through a holistic education that treasures heritage as well as excellence. PWU has pioneered in fields such as food science, nutrition and dietetics, medical technology, pharmacy, and nursing. PWU continues to play an essential role in producing graduates who possess the skills that make them competitive in the country and anywhere in the world.
Gracias. Good morning, everyone. My name is A.K. Okol, artist and a professor at Philippine Women's University, Masters of Fine Arts and Design Department. We welcome everyone to PWS FAD's first lecture event series. This lecture in particular is the last of our lecture series on the avant-garde and its complex history in the world of art. It gives me great pleasure to introduce again our esteemed speaker, Dr. Thomas O. Hackinson, in his final lecture about the avant-garde titled Understanding Dada and the Historical Avant-Garde. We also acknowledge the presence of the Dean of Fine Arts, Dean Josephine Peralba, and MFAD coordinator, Professor Mervio Pueblo. Before we start, may we remind everyone to remain muted at all times during the talk so as not to interrupt the whole event. We would also like for everyone to turn off their webcams in order to prevent any possible connection interruptions while the speaker is talking. As per Dr. Hackinson's preference, we will collect all questions in the FB Live and Google Meet for the questions and answers portion at the end of the lecture. The lecture will be led by Dr. Thomas O. Hackinson. Dr. Thomas O. Hackinson is an Associate Professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, California, USA. His areas of scholarly interest include the artistic avant-garde, as well as historical and cultural studies of science and technology. He holds degrees from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, and Drake University. He has received awards and fellowships from the United States Fulbright Program, the Social Science Research Council, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, the Deutscher Akademischer Austausch Dienst, and the Berlin Program for Advanced German and European Studies, among others. Hackinson is co-editor of the book series Visual Cultures and Germ German Context, and has co-edited several anthologies, including Jürgen Habermas and the European Economic Crisis, Cosmopolitanism Reconsidered, the volume Representations of German Identity, and also Collection Becoming Trans-German. His monograph, Grotesque Visions, The Science of Berlin Dada, was published in June 2021 in the New Directions in German Studies series. And he also edited a volume with Dr. J Jennifer L. Creech, due out in early 2022, titled How to Make the Body, Difference, Identity, and Embodiment with Jennifer L. Creech. Today's lecture is of great interest to the PW community, the Dada art movement, is the penultimate example of critical avant-garde artistic experience. This lecture explains Dada and examines why some scholars nevertheless dismiss the Dada movement as part of an historical avant-garde. Um, without further ado, please join me in listening to Dr. Hackinson's lecture.
my institution in California has campuses located in the Huichen and Yalamu, also known as the Oakland and San Francisco areas of California, the unceded territories of the Chichenyo and Ramatush Ohlone peoples. This land acknowledgement is itself an important part of my talk. Land acknowledgements have become means of recognition and solidarity in a good deal of contemporary scholarly and institutional practice. Put bluntly, land acknowledgements are a way to honor past, present, and future contributions of indigenous peoples and indigenous cultures. While I do not focus on the cultures of the Chichenyo and Ramatush Ohlone peoples in detail today, I do engage with that of the Hopi, formerly called Moki or Moki, the westernmost group of Pueblo Indians situated in what is now the northeastern portion of the state of Arizona in the United States of America. Today, I focus on understanding Dada and the historical avant-garde. The Dada art movement is the ultimate example of critical avant-garde artistic practice in the West. This lecture explains Dada and examines why some scholars nevertheless dismiss the Dada movement as part of a historical or past avant-garde. My talk today focuses on the so-called historical avant-garde exemplified in the work of Sophie Teuber Arp, the Dada movement before and after World War II, which lasted from approximately 1939 until 1945, and the avant-garde today as represented in the work of one particular artist, Adam Pendleton. In my lecture today, I focus on what I think are two particularly efficacious avant-garde strategies for engagement in relation to the idea of decolonization. These strategies are juxtaposition and obfuscation. My focus on these strategies may not always be clear. This lack of clarity may or may not always be intentional. My interest in these strategies comes not only from a relatively new research project on decolonizing the European avant-garde, but also on the research from my book, Grotesque Visions, The Science of Berlin Dada, which was published in June of 2021. That book, Grotesque Visions, is part of Imke Meyer's series, New Directions in German Studies, and informs my lecture today. In Grotesque Visions, I focus on the late 19th and early 20th centuries on a number of members of the artistic avant-garde in Berlin as they familiarize themselves with contemporary scientific developments. I also analyze some of the strategies scientists in Germany developed to convey their findings to the unfamiliar public and the way in which avant-garde artists challenged some of the scientific research in hopes of creating not necessarily just a better informed public, but also a more critical one. Dada served in grotesque visions and serves as well for me today as a key art movement to focus our discussions on avant-garde criticality as well as decolonizing opportunity. Dada's origin story is often told as something like this. The movement began in 1916 in a cafe in Zurich, Switzerland, and was the brainchild of emigre artists and alienated pacifists. Dada's success is associated with its provocations and its popularity evidenced in the fact that the movement quickly spread to other cities across the globe. New York, Paris, Hanover, Cologne, and of course, Berlin. If scholars identify a so-called end to this version of Dada, it is often located in Paris and dated sometime in 1922 or 1923, the result of a conflict between Dada practitioners and other artists who would eventually give birth to a new avant-garde art movement, surrealism. Today and in my current project, I want to tell you the story of the European avant-garde in general and of Dada in particular a bit differently, however. For Berlin Dada philosopher Salomo Friedländer, the artistic grotesque offered a powerful form of avant-garde criticality. Playing himself with the ruses and refractions of identity, Friedländer often wrote using the pseudonym Monona, an inversion of the German word for anonymous or anonym. Always himself, but also always not fully himself, at least in part, anonymous. Monona, I explained in Grotesque Visions, argued that, quote, 
the imagination calls into question knowledge claims based on immediate sensorial experience of the empirical world or artistic aspirations to naturalism or aestheticism and la pour la. The goal of using the imagination as part of a critical artistic strategy, i.e. the grotesque, was to demonstrate the fundamental unity of humanity in spite of perceived differences, end quote. More than a reductive, privileged utopianism, however, Friedlander's ideas come from a place simultaneously of hope and of marginalization. A German-Jewish writer active during the early 20th century, Friedlander experienced directly the horrific effects of anti-Semitism, as well as the extreme financial precarity characteristic of the so-called struggling artist. While Friedlander's views on difference and unity are not the most widely recognized manifestations of the early 20th century Dada movement, they inform key aspects of that movement's worldview and of that movement's history, particularly with respect to that movement's Berlin iterations. I want to point out as well that Friedlander's grotesque vision was utopic, but in a very particular way. Friedlander was not simply fantasizing about a better world. Rather, he was invoking the original concept of the avant-garde as that concept was articulated in 1825 in a text most often attributed to the French utopian socialists Henri de Saint-Simon. As I discussed in my two previous lectures for the Philippine Women's University, Henri de Saint-Simon was a key figure in conceptualizing what became known in the West and then more broadly as avant-garde art. Saint Simone saw in the role of the artist an important figure for transforming the existing social order, even as he and more specifically associated members of the 19th century utopian socialist movement engaged in colonizing practices of their own, for example, in Algiers. I want to quote from the text attributed to Saint Simone, however, before I make a point about this particular idea of the avant garde's colonial colonizing affiliations. Quote It is we artists who will serve as your vanguard. The power of the arts is indeed most immediate and the quickest. We possess arms of all kinds. When we want to spread new ideas among men, we inscribe them upon marble or upon canvas. We popularize them through poetry and through song. We employ by turns the lyre and the flute, the ode and the song the story and the novel. The dramatic stage is spread out before us and it is there that we exert a galvanizing and triumphant influence. We address ourselves to man's imagination and to his sentiments. We therefore ought to always to exert the most lively and decisive action. And while today our role seems non-existent or at least secondary, that is because the arts are missing what is essential to their energy and to their success, a shared impulse and a general idea." End quote. The immediacy of the arts, its power as, quote, the most immediate and the quickest, end quote, form of spreading, popularizing, influencing is still crucial for us today, I would argue. It explains the continued allure of aesthetic experiences, as well as the, as the deleterious effects of social media forms, from Twitter to TikTok, with their powerful visuals, often full of detailed information, but also very short on facts. Recognizing, perhaps even celebrating, the continued power of avant-garde criticality, we cannot and should not ignore the ways in which certain utopian socialist ideas, and European Enlightenment ones as well, became so readily aligned with colonialist and racist ideologies. Yet there is something both crucial and communal in St. Simone's concept of the avant-garde that I think has great use for us today, still, in thinking through what decolonizing the European avant-garde might mean. The artist in St. Simone's formulation served the key function in envisioning a better world and does so in collaboration with others from the existing social order, the industrialist and the scientist. But how the artist communicates this vision is of key importance for understanding avant-garde's criticality. And with respect to the work of contemporary artist Adam Pendleton in particular, I will show the tactics of juxtaposition and obfuscation. As I was researching and writing grotesque visions, I became increasingly interested in what Maria Stavrinaki describes, citing the work of Russian linguist and literary theorist Roman Asapovich Jakobson as the double paradox at the heart of modern art and mastered by practitioners of the Dada movement. Quote, 
In his 1921 text on Dada, Jakobsen noted a double paradox created by modern art's continuous transgressions of the past, the legalization of illegality and the devaluation of successive artistic currents. Dada conquered over all logical contradictions. Things had no absolute value in time and space, not only because they were ephemeral, but also because their interdependence far exceeded their individual particularities." End quote. This idea of a double paradox, as Stavronaki describes it, seems to hold both exceptional promise and to be exceptionally problematic with respect to avant-garde criticality and its relationship to contemporary discussions of decolonization. On the one hand, avant-garde artists increasingly sought to incorporate the limits of aesthetic acceptability in Jakobson's and Stavronaki's formulations to legalize illegality. On the other hand, avant-garde artists witnessed the marginalization, the decline of the arts as tools of social and political transformation. Dada artists did not reject this double paradox. Rather, as Stavronaki suggests, they embraced it. Dada has embraced the limits of what art could be by exploiting that which is not considered art. And Dada artists thrived in seeking to transform art's impact into an immediate quotidian focus on interdependent and communal value rather than individual and isolated commodity form. In both ways, the audience for the avant-garde work became integral, integral to the work's significance. Let me suggest one example of how Dada's engagement with this double paradox, aesthetic innovation and increasing marginalization, might be used as a strategy for decolonizing the avant-garde. Adam Pendleton's Dada Dancer's large study, 2017, plays with innovation and marginalization by focusing on an intersectional, intersubjective interconnectedness evidenced in his source material. To do so, Pendleton uses juxtaposition and obfuscation. There are at least four art historical references in this contemporary work by Pendleton. Two of the references are specific to the Dada movement of the early 20th century, one of the references is to the mid 20th century black arts movement, while the fourth and for us here today final reference is to the Hopi culture and more specifically, the Hopi people's spirit figures known as Katsinas or Kachinas. I will show and explain these art historical references briefly. Let me note now, however, that Pendleton's Dada Dancer's large study is purposefully more than meets the eye. Pendleton, a cisgendered, queer identified black American artist exhibits in this work the strategies of juxtaposition and obfuscation. To these ends, Dada Dancer's large study is a continuation of an interdisciplinary project called Black Dada, which Pendleton began around 2007 or 2008. Much like in the other manifestations of his Black Dada project, Pendleton juxtaposes in this work, Dada Dancer's large study, numerous art historical references. Graphic text overlays Pendleton's silk screen, rendering intersubjective the otherwise distinct figurative forms. It is tough to distinguish one dancer from another, the bodies from the text that overlay or perhaps integrate them. Importantly in Dada Dancer's large study, Pendleton also addresses some of his source material's own iconicity. Pendleton obscures in his Dada Dancer's large, large study the now iconic image barely visible in the center and background of the work a photograph from the 1920s of the Dada artist Sophie Teuber, also known as Sophie Teuber Arp, and another figure in costume. Teuber, inspired by Hopi Katsinas, had made these costumes for a Dada play. But let's turn back again to Dada Dancer's large study. In allowing the viewer to identify the iconic photograph while also seeking to erase or obscure that photograph, Pendleton calls the viewer's attention back to the actual source material, that is, Pendleton brings the viewer's attention back to the indigenous North American Hopi people and the cultural and spiritual significance of the Katsina. In attempting form of cultural and aesthetic decolonization, Pendleton can only return to the Hopi Katsina source material, however, by juxtaposing and obscuring the iconicity of the Toiber photograph. Clearly, I think there is something profoundly important in our current discussions about decolonization. My concern 
with decolonization comes from my own subject position. And the subject position is one primarily of privilege, but also intermittently and unpredictably, one of marginalization as well. To these ends, I use the work of Griselda Pollock as a point of departure and of critical engagement, as a methodology and as a way to articulate my own subject position. In particular, my position here is informed by Pollock's 1992 text, Avant-Garde Gambits, 1883 to 1993, Gender and the Color of Art History. A cisgendered white queer man, I benefit from settler colonialism. My race, my whiteness embedded in a patriarchal system benefit me even as I navigate the asymmetrical terrain of public and political recognition of my same-sex relationships. Asymmetrical insofar as, for me, my queerness is not always a point of marginalization, in fact, can also be a form of access, but it can be cause for prejudice, for limit, for restriction. While these aspects of my presence with you tonight may seem to some simply personal, they are through and through political and from the scholarly point of view of my project, vitally necessary to articulate. They inform my approach, my privilege, my perspective, and my practice. In her forthcoming article on the concept of decolonization, a version which she presented at the Berlin Program Summer Workshop just this year in 2021, Maureen Gallagher suggests that the various ways in which we have come to understand the concept of decolonization is key to realizing the term's potential. Gallagher examines competing ideas of what it means to decolonize and cites a wealth of literature on decolonization to these ends. More specifically, Gallagher suggests that decolonization is, quote, not about destroying, but about acknowledging institutions or ways of life that are unsustainable or no longer supportable. At least two, end quote, at least two competing approaches to decolonization inform Gallagher's thought. The first approach is one associated with a key 2012 text by Yves Tak and Kay Wayne Yang titled, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. A particular excerpt from Tak and Yang's text an excerpt Gallagher cites as well, is helpful in understanding what I would describe as a particularly narrow view of decolonization as a form of pedagogy and methodology. Quote, when metaphor invades decolonization, it kills the very possibility of decolonization. It recenters whiteness, it settles and resettles theory, it extends innocence to the settler, it entertains a settler future. Decolonize, a verb, and decolonization, a noun, cannot easily be grafted onto pre-existing discourse frameworks, even if they are critical, even if they are anti-racist, even if they are just, even if they are justice frameworks. The easy absorption, adoption, and transposing of decolonization is yet another form of settler appropriation. When we write about decolonization, we are not offering it as a metaphor. It is not an approximation of other experiences of oppression. Decolonization is not a swappable term for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. Decolonization doesn't have a synonym, end quote. One of the concerns with Tuck and Yang's approach and others like it is the way in which such a position seems to foreclose the possibility of activating anew the lost, seemingly forgotten past which critical historical and art historical scholarship might recover. Decolonization, to be sure, should not be a metaphor that implicitly or explicitly allows for continued quote unquote settler appropriation. In contrast, however, I would point out that a focus on decolonization should not prevent us from seeking contemporary recognition for historical marginalization or erasure for aesthetic appropriation as a form of intersectional solidarity. Elizabeth McKinley and Caitlin Barney's writing exemplifies to these ends a second approach to the concept of decolonization, one that encourages broader historical and narratological imperatives, even as it also emphasizes repatriation. Quote, decolonization is a concept that takes on different meanings across different contexts. It simultaneously evokes a historical narrative of the end of empire, a particular version of post-colonial political theory, a way of knowing that resists the Eurocentrism of the West, a moral imperative for righting the wrongs of colonial domination, and an ethical stance in relation to self-determination, social justice, and human rights for indigenous peoples enslaved and disempowered by imperialism." End quote. Key for us here is the way in which McKinley and Barney emphasize decolonization as an historical narrative and a way of knowing, in contrast to Tuck and Yang's much narrower concern with decolonization as metaphor. Let me clarify this distinction with two examples. A 
There's another kind of colonization, however, which analysis such as Tuck and Yang's are less effective in addressing. This kind of colonization bears the traces of material objects and geographical territories to be sure, but might more correctly be considered aesthetic, even cultural in a broader sense. In other words, this type of colonization is better addressed via the form of decolonization advocated by McKinley and Barney as a recognition of the appropriation of a people's culture and an examination of the historical narrative to better inform our contemporary ways of knowing. Pictured here on the left are Sophie Teuber and Erika Schlegel in Maskenbau Kostuma, Hopi, Indiana, in Zurich, Switzerland around 1926. The photograph of Teuber's Hopi-inspired costumes allow for, allows for the kind of decolonization advocated by McKinley and Barney. And this photograph's iconicity represents both the problems of European avant-garde colonialism and the lost histories of colonial exploitation, as well as an opportunity for recovering this history and advocating for contemporary intersectional, intersectional coalition building. Teuber created in around 1926 the image shown here, Costume and Veuf, Hopi, Indiana. The costumes Teuber created were based on the Katsina spiritual figures used in the ceremonial and sometimes non-ceremonial functions of the Hopi people who now mostly reside in a reservation in the state of Arizona in the USA. The other image shown here offers examples of Katsina dolls, Nuvakchin Mana, so her snow maiden is on the left, while the turquoise lady is on the right by Hopi Carvers, Stuart Nicholas and Neil David, respectively. These Katsina dolls are sacred objects that are meant to return to the earth. Katsina are spiritual figures in the Hopi tradition, embodied by live performers in costume as part of cultural ceremonies. Katsina can also be embodied in dolls, often exchanged or sold, and which represent various forms of the Katsina spirits. According to some indigenous spokespersons and scholars, that Katsina are sold as tourist objects or even preserved in museum collections goes against the original intention. Rion Polekwaptois, who advised the Herd Museum in Arizona, mentions a particularly revered figure, Chief Wilson Tawakwaptois, who produced non-traditional Katsinas for non-ceremonial purposes. Resituating Teuber's Merkendal Kostumen, Hopi Indiana, in the context of Hopi Katsina culture helps create a more informed historical narrative and a way of knowing with respect to Teuber's appropriation of Hopi culture. We can begin to decolonize more fully works like Teuber's Hopi-inspired costumes and the related iconic photograph by turning to key definitions of the avant-garde. Teuber created in 1926 the image shown here, Costume and Veuve Hopi Indiana, the costumes Teuber created were based on the Katsina spiritual figures used in ceremonial and sometimes non-ceremonial functions among the Hopi people who now reside mostly in a reservation in the state of Arizona in the USA. The other image shown here offers examples of Katsina dolls. Yuvakchen Mana, or Snow Maiden, is on the left while the turquoise lady is on the right by Hopi carvers Stuart Nicholas and Neil David, respectively. Katsina are spiritual figures in the Hopi tradition, embodied by live performers in costume as part of cultural ceremonies. Yet Katsina are sometimes sold as dolls that represent various forms of the Katsina spirits. However, according to some indigenous spokespersons and scholars, that Katsina are sold as tourist objects or even preserved in museum collections goes against the original purpose of the Katsina as ephemeral embodiments of immaterial entities. Rian Olek who advised the Herd Museum in Arizona, mentions a particularly revered figure, Chief Wilson Tawakwaptwa, who produced non-traditional katsinas for non-ceremonial purposes. Resituating Teuber's Maskenbol Kostumen in the context of Hopi and katsina culture helps create a more informed historical narrative and a way of knowing with respect to Teuber's appropriation of Hopi culture. We can begin to decolonize more fully works like Teuber's Hopi-inspired costumes and the related iconic photograph by turning to key definitions of the avant-garde and in particular, and in particular, the avant-garde's concern with ephemerality, iconicity, and time. Spitterberger outlined in response to his much referenced 1974 text, Theorie de Avant-Garde, the avant-garde's potential lies in its imminent critique. 
Eminent critique renders in the context of the avant-garde a fundamentally utopian project, concepts such as origin and authenticity nearly nonsensical. Avant-garde origin stories only paradoxically exist as historical chronologies or in comparative analyses. Paradoxical because the avant-garde work references its own time and not the historical compar or comparative time such analyses would assign it. Brugge notes in his 2010 essay, Avant-Garde and Neo-Avant-Garde, an attempt to answer certain critics of theory of the avant-garde, the role that utopia plays to these ends. Quote, insofar as the historical avant-garde movements respond to the developmental stage of autonomous art epitomized by aestheticism, they are part of modernism. Insofar as they call the institution of art into question, they constitute a break with modernism. The history of the avant-garde, each with its own special historical conditions, arises out of this condition, contradiction. The unification of art and life intended by the avant-garde can only be achieved if it, if it succeeds in liberating aesthetic potential from the institutional constraints which block its social effectiveness. In other words, the attack on the institution of art is the condition for the possible realization of a utopia in which art and life are united." End quote. Put another way, the chronological questions of origin and authenticity are less important, almost nonsensical, when trying to address what Maria Stavrinaki describes as the avant-garde object's interdependence. In emphasizing the ways in which the artwork is more about an interdependence rather than an individual particularity, we can grasp the work's avant-garde criticality without positioning the work as a discrete object, what Stavrinaki describes as an object with, quote, an absolute value in time and space, end quote. What I'm arguing here along the line Stavrinaki suggests is that a focus on the avant-garde work's interdependence better explains the artwork's critical intent. The avant-garde work loses its criticality when we focus for its meaning on historical or comparative analyses. The avant-garde artwork, in other words, is always of its own time, always of its own present moment. The title of Pendleton's Dada Dancer's large study comes in part from a photomontage created by the Berlin-based artist Hannah Huch over the course of two years, 1919 and 1920, entitled Dada Tanz, translated as Dada Dance or Dada Ball. As the work of a variety of scholars from Hannah Bergius to Ralph Burmeister, from Maria Makala to Peter Boswell have shown, Huch was continuously marginalized as the only woman among the otherwise all-male Berlin Dada movement. That marginalization took the form of pejorative dismissal of her work as too decorative or too feminine, as well as the treatment she as, as well as the negative treatment she and her lesbian partner, the Dutch writer Til Puchman, received among members of the supposedly progressive European avant-garde. While Huch's figures show movement and corporal fluidity, they are nevertheless separate and individual at their Dada ball. Pendleton references both the formal fluidity of Huch's work as well as her personal dismissals among fellow avant-garde artists by invoking Dada Tanz. In Pendleton's Data Dancer's large study, it is clear that the bodily movements bleed into the constant artistic imperative for performative reproduction, suggesting the always possible future that presents itself in each new iterative act. The bodies may appear to be used at any moment as textual messages or as corporeal forms. We are unable to determine or to predetermine really what forms these dancers, their textual messages, even their bodily shapes might take in the future. And here, not only the possibilities of the future are important, but also how to communicate these possibilities in a way that does not foreclose chance, change, new opportunity. It is not simply Teuber's Metzgenball Kostüme Hopi Indiana that forms the second reference, but rather the iconicity of the photograph of Teuber and Erika Schlegel from about 1926 that is the intended focus. Using strategies such as blurred reproduction techniques, graphite overlays, silk screen, and repeated reproductions of the photograph itself, Pendleton juxtaposes and obscures simultaneously the source photograph and his own work. In making nearly illegible the source photograph, Dada Dancer, large study, actively seeks to use and to erase that photograph, to problematize it, in other words, and that photograph's privileged position as the primary object of historical reference. The photograph is in the sense that it is both iconic primary as well as a cultural reference of the Hopi people and their Katsina spiritual figures. Pendleton actively seeks to shatter, if not to destroy the photograph's iconicity and redirect the viewer's attention 
to the Hopi culture, which the photograph in Teuber's Maskenball costume had displaced. The final reference for us tonight in Pendleton's effort to decolonize the avant-garde with Dada Dancer's large study is a less explicit one, Amiri Baraka's 1964 poem, Black Dada Nihilismus. The poem informs Pendleton's ongoing Black Dada project and comes from Baraka's involvement with the Black Power and the Black Art movements in the U.S. from the 1960s and 1970s. In many ways, Black Power activities prefigure contemporary social justice campaigns such as the Black Lives Matter movement. It should come as no surprise then that Pendleton's own Black Dada project parallels, parallels the Black Lives Matter movement in much the same way as a Black Arts Movement companion, Black Power campaigns. Baraka's Black Dada Nihilismus is ideally played from the 1964 recording the poet made with the New York Art Quartet, an all Black jazz group. Let me read a few lines of the relatively short poem to give you a sense of its language. This is Amiri Baraka's Black Dada Nihilismus, an excerpt. Quote, from Satra, a white man, it gave the last breath, and we beg him before he is killed, plastique. We do not have only thin heroic blades, the razor, our flail against them. Why you carry knives or brutal lumps of heart? Why you stay where they can reach? Why you sit or stand or walk in this place, a window on a dark warehouse? For the mines packed in straw, new homes, these towers for those lacking money or art, a cult of death need of the simple striking arm under the street lamp, the cutters from under their rented earth. Come up, black dada nihilismus, rape the white girls, rape their fathers, cut the mother's throats. Black dada nihilismus choke my friends in their bedrooms with their drinks spilling and restless for tilting hips or dark liver lips sucking splinters from the master's thigh. Black scream and chant, scream and dull, unearthly hollering dada billowous what ugliness learned in the dome, colored holy shit, I call them sinned or lost burn masters of the lost nihil German killers. All our learned art, remember what you said, money, God, power, a moral code so cruel it destroyed Byzantium, Tenochtitlan, Comanche. Got it, baby? For Tambo, Willie Best, Dubois, Patrice, Mantan, the bronze buckaroos for Jack Johnson, Asbestos, Tanto, Buckwheat, Billy Holiday, or Tom Russ, Lovecher, Vesey, Bojack, may a lost god Dambala rest or save us against the murders we intend against his lost white children, black Dada Nihilismus. End quote. As Daniel Wogu Kim suggests, Baraka's language, not only in his poem, Black Dada Nihilismus, but in others of his works as well is far from radical when situated in the tradition of European Dada. The wonderful world of words. They provoke, they shock, they challenge, yet they also only show the illusion of meaning. Nevertheless, Baraka was jailed for poems like Black Dada Nihilismus, poems that were deemed to be incendiary. This imprisonment for us today, perhaps not, but perhaps not for Barack, was ironic and imperative for silence in spite of the history of slavery and racial injustice to which Barack was respond responding and to which he was trying to bring broader public attention. Barack was successful in his provocation in other ways as well. Wangu Kim suggests that Barack found in Dada key tools for, quote, destroying the degraded language logic of bourgeois Western rationality, end quote. Hilton takes up Baraka's avant-garde imperative of juxtaposition and obfuscation in the Black Data project in general and in works such as Data Dancer's large study in particular. This imperative is a call for racial justice in the 1960s and 1970s. It is parallel today, not only in the social and political efforts of the Black Lives Matter movement, but also in the important work and initiatives in German studies more broadly. This important activity includes not only the significant work of groups such as the Black German Heritage and Research Association and the diversity, decolonization, and the, and the German curriculum movement, but also excellent scholarship, such as Tiffany N. Florville's Mobilizing Black Germany, Afro-German Women and the Making of a Transnational Movement, as well as Mike Sell's avant-garde performance in the limits of criticism, approaching the living theater, happenings fluxus, and the Black arts movement.
Adam Pendleton suggests in his contemporary Black Data project, the important connections among these past efforts at social and political justice and contemporary intersubjective concerns or intersectional concerns. According to Pendleton's 2008 manifesto, quote, Black Data is a way to talk about the future while talking about the past. It is our present moment. The Black Data must use irrational language. The Black Data must exploit the logic of identity. Black Dada must use, must, is neither madness nor wisdom nor irony nor naivete. Black Dada, we are successive. Black Dada, we are not exclusive. Black Dada, we abhor simpletons and are perfectly capable of an intelligent discussion. The Black Dada's manifesto is both form and life. Black Dada, your history of art. Pendleton emphasizes both juxtaposition and obfuscation in many of the Black Data works, including Black Data Flag, Black Lives Matter from 2018. In this installation, Pendleton brings attention to past and contemporary forms of racism and racial injustice in the United States. Locating his Black Data Flag at the site of a portion of Randall's Island, a site with a particularly troubling racial history. Pendleton's Black Data Flag, Black Lives Matter is a site-specific work to these ends, meant to both identify with a specific time and place, and also to reject the historical and geographical erasures that such ontological reverentiality demand. Black Data Flag, Black Lives Matter invokes and challenges the past, the problematic geography, and returns us to that problematic history, a problematic history that is still with us. Yet curator William Edwards in 2008 notes that she hopes works like Pendleton's will, quote, serve as a platform to help us imagine what possible, what's possible today through the poetics of protest by breaking down boundaries between galleries and the street, the artist and the audience, and making new propositions that open up conversations about the role of art in today's society, end quote. Pendleton further explores juxtaposition and obfuscation as forms of our avant-garde criticality in his current exhibition at New York's Museum of Modern Art, MoMA. In that exhibition titled, Who is Queen? Pendleton examines the myriad forms and points of contact made possible by his own identity as a cisgendered queer black man. In so doing, Pendleton also insinuates the museum viewer in an effective erasure of the museum's institutional boundaries. Figuratively unbuilding the institution of art from the inside out, Pendleton's massive installation includes scaffolding, large-scale sculptures and paintings, and interactive videos and projections. Forcing the viewer to become part of a museum that he has effectively created inside MoMA's structure, Who is Queen provides for a recognition of interdependence, of juxtaposition and obfuscation, and telling another history of an iconic institution. Much like Dada Dancer's large study, Pendleton's main point with respect to the exhibition Who is Queen and much of his Black Data project is the extent to which this other history, the history of racial oppression, of misogyny, of colonialism, homophobia, transphobia, are always there to be revealed. The avant-garde artist uses their work to reveal these suppressed histories through imminent avant-garde critique. It should come as both a surprise as well as a necessity that due to the ongoing global pandemic or endemic, Adam Pendleton's recent show at New York City's Museum of Modern Art coincided with another important exhibition, one that was on display only after a year's pandemic obligated delay, an exhibition featuring the art artist Sophie Teuber Arp and called Living Abstraction. What are we to make of the contemporary, unplanned, but supposedly obligatory coincidence of Pendleton's and Teuber Arp's exhibitions at MoMA? What does having these two artists on exhibition in the same venue, in the same approximate space, simultaneously suggest, especially given that these artists' complex works collectively call into question expectations of gender subordination, colonial reparation, sexual normativity, racialized primitivism and non-binary exclusion. I do not think there is one answer here. Perhaps luck is the best and easiest way to conceive of the points of contact represented across historical time and surfaced in present time in the Pendleton and Harbor Arp exhibitions. But perhaps 
just perhaps these two artists and their works are exactly what we needed here at just the right time. Let me return one last time to Pendleton's Dada Dancer's large study with its many layered references to the work of historical avant-garde Dada artist Sophie Teuber Arp to emphasize just how complex and insightful I find this work. I outlined the ways in which decolonizing the avant-garde might mean revealing the interdependence, the intersectionality of the artwork's references offering a contrast to approaches that seek to focus on historical origin stories or concepts such as authenticity to make their claims. I identified the ways in which the work of Peta Berga, Griselda Pollock, Marina Stavernaki, and Everett Lee Roy Jones or Amiri Baraka inform my approach. And I spent a good deal of time examining the references for Adam Pendleton's Dada Dancer's large study, not only Sophie Teuber Arp, but also Hannah Huch, Amiri Baraka, and others. I want to note in closing my last of these three Philippine Women's University lectures on contemporary efforts to decolonize the supposedly European historical avant-garde, what a pleasure it has been to be with you, to share our time together, even as you are in the Philippines, across the many miles from where I sit in Sacramento, California, and where I teach in San Francisco and Oakland as well. I look forward to our discussions today and to continue the conversations about avant-garde criticality, colonial appropriation, and the promises and possibilities of creative voices, creating a better global future for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hackinson. That was that was a great series of talks that we've had. I think it started around November, I think, or October. So um maybe now open the floor for the question and answer portion. But since we don't have enough time, we will be limiting uh the the questions coming in um while no one's posting their question yet i was i was just i know um what you call that i was like zoning in when you mentioned sir about um oh is this here questions about oh there there's there's a question maybe i could <laughs> note one later it says in john didion's slouching towards bethlehem she explores the 1960s Kate Ashbury counterculture movement, also known as the hippie movement. Given how Dadaism explores counterculture, what can you say about the movement, seeing as it is heavily criticized because it was made up of privileged drug users? I, I was going there then. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. And thank, hopefully uh, the audio is OK. Uh, AK, please let me know. I know my audio has been very hidden this as my internet has been also today so apologies um i i don't know enough about the hippie movement specifically to talk about the 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 composition of the movement and the privileged nature of those involved or not um it's it certainly was part of a number of movements happening in the u.s more broadly and even impacting the bay area san francisco oakland uh, directly uh certainly this was the period of the civil rights movement in the u.s um, that was taking place across much of the country here uh, in the 60s, as well as the Great Society campaigns of Lyndon Johnson. So we were seeing massive amounts of infrastructure uh, and class-oriented um, uh, sort of uh, movements and efforts to recognize, uh, you know, the kind of impoverishment of certain portions of the U.S. and efforts to build up uh, those those uh, class-based differences and acknowledge those class-based differences through uh, programs like the Great Society campaigns. Um, and then also, of course, you know, this is a period of the women's liberation movement, which was very active um, uh, during the 60s and 70s 
and uh, the gay lesbian movement in the U.S. sort of uh, was bubbling up at the same time, and San Francisco was, and in, in many sense, may, senses maybe still is an epicenter for that movement, um, which sort of culminated, as many many folks may know, in 1969, in the Stonewall Inn riots in New York City. So we see a number of social movements happening simultaneously. Uh, so I think, um, to your point, uh, uh, Ethan David, that um, uh, you know, the Haight-Ashbury area is still synonymous with sort of a, uh, a kind of anti-institutional uh, countercultural vibe. Uh, and there still is, if you've not been to the San Francisco area recently, still is a large drug presence there, not necessarily a, a one connected with protests, but perhaps with, with um, other kinds of things, disenfranchisement, mental health, uh, lack of social support, lack of social infrastructure. Um, and uh, so I would just say it's connected that particular thing you put your finger on with Haight-Ashbury in the 60s um, was part of a larger cultural movement in the U.S. And I don't think it's that dissimilar to what's happening maybe uh, globally today, but also very specifically in the U.S. We're still seeing, you know, have been seeing large-scale protests across uh, all forms of, um, a number of forms of uh, disenfranchisement, um, intersectional alliances being formed along those lines. But a good question. And I am a big fan of Joan Didion, as you probably know, she passed away fairly recently um, and has a wonderful book called uh, The Year of Magical Thinking, which is about her own, uh, her, her loss of both her husband and her daughter in a fairly short period of time. Kind of as a side point, it's a wonderful memoir of, of, um, of dealing with kind of losing a loved one. So I'm familiar with her literature uh, in that sense as well. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you, Dr. Hackinson. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was also thinking, um, it was mentioned uh, a while ago about a, ut a utopia where art and life can occur together. But at the same time, I was thinking like, um, Art tends to have this like really privileged language, and then there, um, every individual has this um, personal identity that clashes sometimes with, you know, especially you know when, when we're talking about que queerness and how to how it coincides with social class and um, race and all that. So I was I was wondering like how does that fit in into the utopic idea of like art and and life happening at the same time or is it like um a really optimistic view or i was just thinking about it a while ago yeah no it's an excellent question ak and i think there is that real issue of privilege that still circulates you know just the, yes. the ability um even to kind of think, and this, we're a very particular audience here today, you know, and I'm talking to you in a particular way, uh, because mm -hmm. I know this is a university context, and we all are, you know, sort of engaged and, and educated, at, you know, to, at a certain to a certain level. And um, uh, so, you know, the way in which we can talk about some of the things I wanted to address with respect to the the colonial dimensions of the European avant-garde and Pendleton and Sophie Toyberg sort of referencing uh, that history and the, the appropriation of the Hopi Indian culture or the use of the Hopi Indian culture. Um, you know, so I realize I'm speaking to a particular audience and I wouldn't necessarily talk the same way um, in other audiences and simply because, it, you know, I used a lot of jargon and uh, concepts and, and things, uh, you know, so I recognize that that's a little bit of, that's part of the privilege of being able to be at university and and uh, becoming familiar with some of the names and some of the concepts and some of the figures. So there's that, but art in and of itself, to your point, even more specifically, AK, trying to bridge that distinction between art and life, which was so instrumental to the Dadaists and very important to the early European Dadaists. And I think at some level um, is still very important to someone like Adam Pendleton, uh, but he is, he is um, uh, you know, the, the language he uses, even the visual language is challenging to engage it's in, in the same way that some of the early stuff that Toyber Arp did designing costumes for very shocking um, plays and performances that sort of upset the audience causes causing audience members to leave 
the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, Switzerland, not, totally confused, not having no idea what the heck was going on on stage. Um, so there's still that element of sort of, um, we might call it alienation, um, and, and, but we might also think of it as a little bit of playfulness as well. And and I, I don't, I think the artists that use that tactic like Toiber Arp and like Pendleton that are in that Dada tradition of play and ambiguity um, and abstraction becomes very important in this sense for Pendleton. They're inviting interpretation. They're not excluding interpretation. They're not saying this is the only way to understand this work. Uh, and so certainly, you know, um, I, I've told folks before, of course, this is my view on, on Adam Pendleton's work. And, you know, I've engaged with him at some level, uh, you know, communicated back and forth about things, but I'm not an interlocutor and I'm not a mouthpiece for Pendleton and, you know, or, or vice versa, I would never expect to be in that position. So his work is put out there to be interpreted and engaged in any way that, you know, we can, can encounter and engage it, um, whether that be in the museum or the the Black Lives Matter flag, the Black Dada flag project from 2018, um, sort of a very site specific, you know, it was in a park in Brooklyn or in, in New York, uh, just outside of Manhattan, a small island called Randall's Island. So it's there to be, you know, to be for us to talk about and discuss and, and engage. It's not meant to be a monolithic uh, thing and this is the only way to interpret it. So in that sense, the privilege is, is one of appearance only, I think, you know, that it's the, the work is there for us to encounter and engage and and that's part of the magic uh, of the aesthetic experience that i find so beneficial and really try to emphasize that it is about um having uh, that opportunity to engage and discuss uh with others and have different perspectives and different opinions and and um well, you know that's that's part of the, the the aesthetic criticality that i think is really at the heart of the data project in general okay so we have one last question, and this is from Gabriel. Um, Hi, Professor Hackenton. I gather that techniques and data such as obfuscation and juxtaposition can blur associations of the artwork with the meanings attached to it and to history as seen in the work of Pendleton. Do you think that the avant-garde today follow a similar tone where meaning and symbolism is be prioritized over the obscuring of images and their problematization. Interesting also how you mentioned how metaphors can appropriate a colonial position where association of meaning can lead to the misunderstanding of the more pressing issues surrounding the artwork. Yeah. Well, I think there is really something just in general, Gab, about the, the ambiguity. I really uh, think it, that's key to, you know, Pendleton is not a commercially unsuccessful artist, but he certainly is not embracing the market in the way some of the folks we have seen and talked about in the in the class we're we're having together um jeff coons and and um uh you know um uh, others uh, like uh coons uh, the artist cause k-a-w-s for example and and damien hirsch who openly embrace the market and aren't necessarily critical of of you know art being objectified and used as a form of commerce so i think that ambiguity is very much key um for Pendleton and it's not about a it's not about creating a spectacle uh, for the sake of um you know getting folks to take selfies and, and buy copies so I think there's that element which I really um feel is important and then just the idea of um of you know so that that's sort of in opposition to some of the other work that we might consider avant-garde today that that maybe um and I wouldn't necessarily consider the the artists that I just mentioned, you know, Coons and Cause and Hearst is, is avant-garde in any way. They're they're really commercial and exceptionally successful in that in that endeavor. Um, so the avant-gardists that we see today that are sort of um, trying to bring the history back into the conversation uh, and the exploitation back into the conversation through these these mechanisms uh, of of um, like obfuscation, as I mentioned, and then juxtaposition. I think those are really um, one of the figures that we've talked a little bit about in class that I still think is is doing some amazing work, even though he is also commercially quite successful, but not at the same level of Coons or Hirsch or Cause is um, Maurizio Catalan. I mean, we, we've talked about Comedian, the banana duct tape to the wall uh, at Miami Basel. Just we, we've been chatting about it in our class and um, the way in which it's 
it's a critical intervention into the art market, but also into some of the social practices around exploited labor, um, you know, uh, colonizing, uh, uh, colonizing, uh, you know, industrial farming and colonization with a kind of through line to the West uh, and to the, the, you know, to the US and to Europe of goods produced elsewhere. So there's, there's um, that important dimension, I think that, um, the history is brought back into the conversation and the tactics that people like that uh, Pendleton and others use, I think, uh, really, you know, force or are meant to force the viewer to recognize that history um, by being uh, obtuse at some level and obfuscating the kind of references. And then uh, by also juxtaposing, um, you know, some of the things they're doing in the more contemporary fashion with historical reference points, uh, the, the, you know, the, the three or four including the Hopi culture that I mentioned in the talk today with Pendleton's piece. So um, yeah, lots of great things. And those two texts, if you've not read Tuck and Yang, of course you should, if you've not read them on uh, decolonizing and then um, other folks that are doing some really amazing work, thinking less strictly about what that term means in a context of um, recognition uh, and, um, and efforts to decolonize some of our scholarly and aesthetic practices. Okay, unfortunately, uh, uh, first, thank you, Gabriel. Um, unfortunately, we have to end our Q&A. However, you may email uh, Dr. Hackinson at thackinson at cca.edu if you have other questions, you can personally email him. So thank you, everyone, for attending our lecture series. We also thank Dr. Hackinson for lending his time in all three lectures. Um, I'm pretty sure we all learned from these lectures. They were really beautiful and insightful lectures. Um, we will now again proceed with the university hymn. Again, thank you, Dr. Hackinson and the PW community. Thank you.